Jarrah land, home of the Jar Jar Wurrung people. For many millennia they tended this land. They sang its songs and danced its stories. We acknowledge that sovereignty of this country was never ceded, and we pay our respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. Welcome to worship with the Waruna congregation here in Bendigo. Again, we especially welcome people from beyond our regular congregation who share with us in worship today. Should you find yourself in Bendigo in the future, when church is able to be physically, physically gather again, please come and make yourself known. We would love to meet you in person. This will be my last Sunday with you. Of course, worship will continue. And in a few weeks, your regular minister, Susan, will be back from parental leave. I have led worship for five months. All but the, last, all but the first three weeks of which have been online. It has been for me a positive experience Challenging, yes, but satisfying too. I'm most grateful for the privilege of sharing with you through this time. And I deeply appreciate the incredible gifts of the many people who have made it happen. Thank you. We stand on the shore of God's new day and look ahead to what is yet to be. So much has become strange, unpredictable. Where once we were confident, now we simply do not know. Not that we ever really did. Lord, we look to you. We have chosen to put our trust, our hope in you. Gather us now from our distant corners and speak to us. We give you our worship and return your love. Let's sing the hymn, Christ Be Our Light.
pray. Come, O Spirit of God, breathe your life and fill these vessels of clay that we might delight again in the treasure that we bear through Jesus the Christ. Speak your word again that we might listen and grow and be renewed in love for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For our prayer of confession this morning, we're going to sing the song, Lord, where have we left you? In the Spirit's size, we are renewed to realize God's purposes for us. Nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Behold, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We'll have a brief gospel Reading from Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. Last week, we invited you to send in images of music and song, some of those things that are so important to us in our day-to-day -day life, and especially when we come together to worship God. Let's enjoy those images now.
next week something special. August the 6th is Hiroshima Day, which is uh, just a few days after we're meeting again. Hiroshima Day marks the anniversary of the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. This year marks 75 years since atomic bombs were dropped upon Hiroshima and three days later, Nagasaki. Between 150 and 220,000 people were killed, mostly civilians. And so what I'd like you to do next week is send in images of peace. I've put a few together to give us some ideas. Let's have a look at them now. The first image is by Otto Dix, who was a, uh, a soldier in the First World War. And this is some of his pictures of the, the horrors of war. The second image is by our good friend Picasso. It's called Guernica, perhaps the most famous painting of the 20th century. It's a reflection upon the Spanish Civil War. The next image is a statue from the city of Benella, statue of Weary Dunlop. Uh, and it was uh, sculpted by a man called Louis Lohmann. The next image shows the de devastation wrought upon the city of Hiroshima. Following that, we have a statue that was erected in the Hiro Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. It's a statue of Sadako Sasaki. She was a child who died of radiation sickness about a decade after the war. And uh, every year, people fold paper cranes and, and send them, and they're laid at the foot of that statue. It's a very famous story, I'm sure, Many of you will have heard it. We have another image by Picasso. Then we have a pic picture from the 1960s, part of the, uh, the, the uh, poster challenging what we were doing in the war in Vietnam. Following that, we have an image by George Gittos, a, a famous Australian artist who has sent many images of suffering from war zones. This one came from Rwanda in the 1990s. It's called The Preacher. Then there's a line I cut of my own from my Jesus and the Goth series. On Hiroshima Day, Jesus learns how to fold a paper crane. And that's followed by an image with a haiku. The haiku reads, as if the first one caused insufficient sorrow, Nagasaki too. But having told you what you're doing next week, I just want to share something else. Today, when we uh, come to our Bible reading, we have an image of earthen vessels, pots of clay. Uh, this is a, an, a, uh, a pilgrim flask made by a Ballarat artist called John O'Loughlin. And it's, it's rather beautiful. And uh, it's just something that I have and I really enjoy. And um, it's a vessel of clay. It holds stuff or it's designed to hold stuff. And uh, that's what Pots of clay, jars of clay, vessels of clay do. We'll talk more about that when we get to our sermon. I'll just put it back here. We're going to sing the hymn, The Great Love of God.
I've divided our Corinthians reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 into two parts. We'll hear the first part now, verses 1 to 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul is putting himself out there. He has nothing to hide. He is open, transparent, and so is his ministry. He sees his ministry as a precious gift from God, a privilege. No trickery or cunning, no clever words, just the truth. The glorious light of Jesus shining in the darkness, bringing illumination, enlightenment, hope, salvation and life. This same light of Christ shines in his and in all believers' hearts to give, quote, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It shines in him. It shines through him to bring that same enlightenment and hope and salvation to others. No trickery or cunning or clever words, just the gospel, as Paul understands it. And if you can't hear those gospel words, if for those who can't see the glorious light of Jesus, well, says Paul, it's because the God of this world keeps them in darkness. Now, many of us are not all that comfortable with this, what we call dualism. Um, but perhaps we might think of it as this, as the deceptive lies, the distractions, the seductions of this world, the lures of power and wealth and comfort. These things, these are the things which are keeping us from seeing the light that comes from Christ. So Paul and his friends, they're going to keep shining that light of Jesus no matter what happens to them. They're going to keep telling the remarkable good news because one day, one day, that veil of blindness might be lifted and those previously in darkness will be able to see the face of Jesus and will be able to hear his gospel word and may receive, yet receive his gospel invitation to come to him. Yes, Paul and his friends are determined to keep shining that light of Jesus. They'll keep telling that wondrous good news and there is nothing that will be able to stop them because they are servants of the gospel. And that is their precious gift from God. Let's move on and hear the second half of our reading from verses 7 to 18. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 18. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed, and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus, and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. The treasure in earthen vessels, or clay jars, as our modern translations might put it, this is a most concrete image that speaks of something of immense value. It struck me that this image in Paul has a strong connection with that brief parable that Jesus told. And perhaps Paul was familiar with it, perhaps where this image for him originally came. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then, in his joy, he goes and he sells all that he has, and he buys that field. You can read that in Matthew chapter 13. And it's what you did with your wealth in ancient times. All those coins, no safe deposit boxes, you take a clay jar. Pottery is enduring, it doesn't rot. You put your coins in and with any other valuables that you might happen to have. You seal up the lid with some wax and you bury it, possibly near a tree, maybe next to the wall of your house. For security reasons, you keep the location secret. And then, one day, you die unexpectedly, without telling anyone where you hid your hoard. The treasure is lost. Maybe hundreds of years pass. Walls crumble. A labourer is hired to plough a field. And the scenario is set up for the parable that Jesus told. The treasure in the field. The treasure in that clay jar. You set up everything in order to attain it. Jars of clay. They're humble domestic vessels. Nothing special, but useful just the same. Containing treasure. In the gospel story, the treasure is an image of the kingdom life. We stumble upon it when we weren't even looking for it. 
that once we recognise its worth, nothing, nothing can be allowed to prevent us from taking hold of it. For Paul, the treasure is equally wondrous. It is life. It is love. It is reconciliation. It is grace and hope and the glorious victory of the resurrection. It is the very presence of Jesus. It is the gospel which we are called, called to serve. And this treasure, Paul says, is contained in jars of clay. Jars of clay. Humble domestic vessels, nothing special, but useful all the same. And Paul has moved the focus from the treasure to the vessels. The treasure is entrusted to you, to me. We are the jars of clay. Ordinary, common, humble, utilitarian vessels, nothing special, nothing flashy, far from perfect, perhaps even with a chip or two or a crack. You and me. Sometimes we feel underwhelmed by our own limitations and shortcomings, especially when challenged by God's call to be disciples of Jesus. Me? What can I do? What difference can I make? I'm not good with words. I wouldn't know what to say. I don't have any special gifts. I'm not the sort of person who attracts other people. If someone were to ask me about my faith, I wouldn't know where to begin. No, fellow earthen vessels, but you hold a great treasure. You carry Christ. Ordinary, common, humble, utilitarian vessels, nothing special, nothing flashy, you and me. Not you by yourself, not me by myself, you, me, us together, we we have this treasure in jars of clay. Collectively, we as a church, we are vessels of clay. There is nothing special about us. People look at us. Some of them laugh. Others wonder why we spend our time in worship in coming together in fellowship, engaging with our community, participating in programs of justice, speaking truth, giving away our money, doing kind, generous and good stuff without expecting anything in return. For Paul and his friends, they must have faced the same questions. And even stronger, as the people of their world wondered who they are and what they thought they were doing. And we read, quote, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death 
of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. Why do you do this, you followers of the crucified one? The critics say. You are people just like us. You are nothing special. And they are right. We are nothing special. We are merely jars of clay. Humble, ordinary, unremarkable. Ah, but we have this treasure. We have this treasure. And we know that this treasurer, <laughs> we know that this treasure is not ours to keep, to hold, to guard. It is not given as a possession for me to glory in. It's something that I hold for the sake of others. This treasure is to be used. It is to be lived. We must express its reality daily as we live and move and breathe and act and speak, as we love, as we join and connect in actions of blessing and hope and reconciliation, in actions for justice, for the sake of the poor, the struggling, the oppressed, the brutalized, the victimized, the discarded. It is for these that this treasure has been given to us. For the battered women, the abused children, the lonely and the despairing ones, for the refugees and asylum seekers on Nauru, in Papua New Guinea, in hotel detention in Australia, and in detention centres, and in border camps in Myanmar, Thailand, Turkey, and for our grandchildren, to whom we are delivering a broken and despoiled planet. For the black people left to wonder if their lives are valued. For our first peoples robbed of country and dignity. The treasure we bear is for these. Like any treasure, this treasure that we carry is no light thing. It has weight, not as a burden, but as a gift of immensity, the value of which will only be realized when we return it to God in our love, and in our actions. Ah, but we have this treasure. We have this treasure. Let us pray. God, we are clay pots. Tip us over, pour us out, crack us open if need be, that the treasure of your life, your love, your hope and your liberation might spill forth from us to the people, to the people you love, the people among whom we are sent. And so shall we be made rich and know your true fullness of life. Amen.
will sing the hymn, God himself is present. Remember that we are part of a great company who also carry the Spirit of Jesus. With the Spirit of God, our tiny offerings become storehouses of hope. Our barely visible ministries become important to make another world possible. We give ourselves, our lives, our offering in sacred trust. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we set before you our gifts as signs that we are yours, that we are committed to the mercy and faithfulness, the justice and peace which Christ has come to bring. Grant that in whatever we undertake, we may be empowered by your Spirit to do it in the name of Christ your Son, who lives and reigns for ever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray. God, there is so much we need to talk about, so much that makes us anxious, concerned, and angry. Our first peoples living between two worlds, struggling for respect, so often disempowered by a dominant culture that is convinced that it, it knows what is best. You know it's not right, God. Refugees and people seeking asylum who came to our shores asking for protection, betrayed by evil politics, driven to mental illness and despair. Some of these innocent people have been in prison for seven years, God, still with no hope of release. And yet we fail to be outraged. Rich people are tearing your creation apart, God, digging up its resources, cutting down its forests, burning ancient fossil fuels to make money as quickly as they can, without any thought for the planet's future or that of our grandchildren. God, make us angry enough to do something. God, with Hiroshima Day in the offing, we are reminded of the costs of conflict, of the waste of human lives and resources. We think of how little is expended in the elimination of poverty and the building of peace, and we weep at the shame. Bless the peacemakers, O oh God. And then there's the COVID-19 thing, God. It's hurting us and people we know. And it maddens us when we hear of people who don't seem to care, who don't consider others. Help us always to love. Help us always to love, God, to use your precious gifts to care for each other and our world. Make us brave and generous and passionate to stand up for your truth, to resist injustice, to proclaim the presence of your kingdom and to do your will. We pray for the Wiruna congregation and its people as they journey towards your kingdom as your people. Grant them insight into the challenges of these changing and uncertain times and wisdom in making their responses. We pray for the leaders of this congregation and all its members as they minister together in your name. God, be with those who struggle Weep with those who mourn. Laugh with those who experience delight. And bless all who must make difficult choices. Let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We sing the hymn, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You.
Go forth, you vessels of clay. You carry the treasure of God's good news. Go forth, you earthen jars. You hold the wondrous presence of the risen Christ. Go forth, you ceramic pots. Yours is the message of life for all humankind. Go forth, disciples of Jesus, ambassadors of God's kingdom, creators of hope, agents of justice, servants of love. And may the blessings of the divine parent, the friendship of the ever-present son, and the excitement of the unconfined spirit be with you always. Amen. mentioned uh, at the start of worship today was his final service with us during his supply with Waruna so we just want to thank you Ken for your leadership and support um, during this time that was unexpected when we uh, asked you to fill in while Susan was on leave so thank you for your passion, your compassion, and the incredible knowledge of art that you have um, imparted onto us during this time. So uh, I'd offer you a handshake, but we can't. So peace be with you. <laughs>